We are live. Thank you for joining us for the next installment of the Open Worm Journal Club. Uh, so in, we've been reviewing uh, a lot of interesting topics over the last uh, several months in this uh, revitalized uh, session. Uh, and today I'm really excited uh, that we have uh, Andre Brown here to speak about a recent paper that's just come out uh, related to one of the important components of uh, a project to better understand the behavior of our friend, the C. elegans. Um, we'll be talking about uh, essentially how do we break down and understand uh, the behavior of really any animal, but uh, in this case using the C. elegans as the specific, uh, the specific animal of interest um, into a, a system that can help us better understand uh, you know, what's going on in its nervous system, how it's working. Uh, in that in that sort of way. So we've assembled a great panel here to think about this uh, question with us um, and to really kind of get into the uh, the meat of the issues with this. Um, and I'd like to uh, introduce them now. By the way, I'm Stephen Larson, uh, coordinator of uh, the Open Worm Project. And uh, so now let's kind of go through and uh, meet our panelists. Um, let's start uh, on the what's on my far left uh, with uh, Aiden. Um, um, I'm Aiden Rock, an undergraduate math student at Edinburgh University, and so I'm based in Edinburgh, and um, I've been working on um, uh, an implementation of Andrew Brown's uh, MATLAB behavioral syntax code uh, in Python 3, which is on GitHub. Great. Thanks for joining us. We'll go to Ben next. Hey, my name is Ben. I'm a PhD student at UC San Diego. I study soft robotics and fabrication methods like 3D printing, and I'm interested in integrating neuroscience aspects into my project. Great. Thanks, Ben. Let's go to Jim next. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim. I'm a postdoc at Duke University, and my involvement uh, with this group is uh, through Open Worm, working on the uh, Worm Analysis Toolbox. Thanks for joining, Jim. Uh, we'll go to Michael next. Hi, so I'm, uh, I'm Michael Curry. I am a software uh, professional in uh, Calgary in Canada. And with Jim, I work on the, the Open Worm Analysis Toolbox. Great. Thank you for joining. Rex? I'm Rex Kerr. I am an associate scientist at Calico Life Sciences. Um, and among other things, I do um, high throughput uh, worm imaging and behavioral analysis. Great. Thanks for joining us. And Tiffany? Hi, I'm Tiffany Timbers. I'm a postdoc in Michelle LaRue's lab at Simon Fraser University. That's just outside of Vancouver, BC, in Canada. And I'm, uh, I work on C. elegans behavior and the genetic basis for that. And so I do a lot of um, uh, high throughput worm behavior. Excellent. For joining us as well. All right, and we also have a uh, co-author on this paper, uh, Alex Gomez Marin. Um, would you like to introduce yourself as well, please? Sure. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a theoretical physicist by training, but I've been working a few years already in behavioral neuroscience, and I recently moved to Alicante, which is in the Mediterranean coast of Spain, to start my own lab. And I have the pleasure of working with Andre on on this project of the world syntax and other stuff that's going on. It's a pleasure to be with you. Beautiful. Great to have you. All right, and last but not least, Andre, if you can introduce yourself, and then uh, we'll go right into the presentation. Yes, I'm uh, Andre Brown. Uh, I'm a group leader at the MRC Clinical Sciences Center, which is at uh, Imperial College in London. And uh, like Rex and Tiffany, also do a lot of high throughput uh, behavior analysis at worms. Uh, main goal being to connect genes to behavior, but uh, of course, to make that connection, that also involves some neuroscience, uh, so that's also uh, of interest. And today I'm going to talk uh, about our recent paper that we just put on BioArchive a couple of months ago on behavioral syntax, uh, uh, and especially on using compression algorithms to try to understand something about worm behavior. Um, but uh, before I start, I, I just should say, uh, please interrupt as much as you like. Um, I think that'll keep the, uh, keep the talk at the right level, as Stephen said. Um, and I'm probably going to talk about half on some introductory material and really only get into the paper in the second half. That's because the sort of things described in that paper are relatively specific, and I think it's important to have a little bit of more general background um, 
in place before we before we jump in. So I'm going to try and sh share my screen here. Let me know if it doesn't work. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so I'll jump right in um, and give a little bit of um, sort of background motivation. Um, so this uh, this video I'm going to show comes from one of my sort of favorite experiments. Uh, one of the reasons I really like it is it's a little bit sort of out there, but it's basically this this project on uh, Siberian foxes where um, this group decided that they would breed foxes for uh, either aggressive or uh, tame behaviors. And they did this over sort of epic experiment over 50 years. So it's about one generation per year. I think it is one generation per year. They went through 50 generations of breeding. And, and the results are quite astounding. Hopefully, you can also get some, some audio here. This is what they look like. So as you can imagine, those are the foxes that have been bred for uh, aggressive behaviors. Um, and really, all they're bred for is sort of discomfort, I guess, as scored by uh, a scientist as they, as they approach the foxes. You can see they become extremely aggressive. They, they spontaneously uh, attack the, uh, the humans. Uh, and you can compare that to the other group. So these are the uh, sort of half of the population that they've, been, that they've been splitting and breeding for 50 years, which are more docile. Half a century on, the 50th generation of foxes are tamer than ever. It's an accelerated model of how dogs might have been domesticated from wolves. So you can see these are now uh, almost entirely uh, tame. They're completely different from the other set. And, and there's a couple of reasons I think this is uh, interesting. I mean, one is that uh, we know these differences are genetic, because they come about as a result of this selective breeding. So we know there's some sort of underlying genetic change that has caused these complex differences in their behavior. Um, one thing that fascinates me is that it's actually a very sort of complex, multifaceted phenotype. There are all sorts of aspects of their behavior that change, and even uh, some aspects of their morphology. So you can see apparently that there are differences in coloration and things that start to come up. So these are probably genes that are linked to things that they're selecting for. Um, but it's, it's trying to capture the sort of nature of these complex, multifaceted changes that, that I find very interesting. Um, which brings me to sort of the, the general problem that I'm interested in, which is essentially trying to understand something about behavioral genetics. So that is how differences in the genome, uh, as you can see. Can you see my cursor? Can someone tell me if you can see my cursor? Anyone? Anyway, OK. Hopefully you can see. Yes, like, yes we can see it. Visible. Small but seeable, OK. Um, OK, so then I will try to use it to point. Hopefully it will work. Um, Right, so what we're interested in are these changes in the uh, genome, so genome variation, uh, and how that ultimately gives rise to differences in behavioral output. And there are many sort of levels through here that we would ultimately like to understand. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I think the main point is that when we're talking about genomes, we know what we're talking about. We have very good representations for uh, genetic differences. We know we're talking about chromosomes inside of cells. Uh, we know the genetic code. We, which we're also very good now at uh, reading. So we can read off sequences. We can translate uh, that code into uh, protein sequences. We really know what we're talking about. And it also turns out to be very universal. So we can compare this code between even bacteria and humans, because it's extremely highly conserved. But what we lack is a similar sort of uh, language or representation for talking about these kinds of complex behavioral differences, which are ultimately what we're really interested in. So we want to make that connection. But um, in my opinion, we need to do a much better job of representing those behavioral differences, um, hopefully in a more universal way. So of course, for foxes, this is a very difficult uh, problem. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we focus on worms, on C. elegans. Um, probably everyone in this audience knows already, but this is what worms look like in the lab. So this is a uh, uh, petri dish in the top left-hand corner. It's got a bacterial lawn that you can see is sort of slightly darker color. And the worms are um, about a millimeter long, these little sort of commas that you can see. Uh, one thing that's relevant here is that even if we zoom into sort of electron microscopic resolution, which you can see in the bottom right corner here, uh, we're still talking about a relatively simple morphology. It's basically a tube. 
So when we're trying to comp uh, characterize these potentially complex behavioral differences, um, our life is somewhat easier compared to limbed animals. You can just sort of quantify that uh, changes in that, in that tube-like shape. Uh, the other feature which you are certainly extremely familiar with is that the nervous system itself is also much smaller than most of the other organisms we would want to study. Um, and this, again, is important if we want to eventually sort of get a multi-scale understanding of how differences in the genome ultimately give rise to differences in the behavioral output. We have a much better chance of doing that uh, sort of from the uh, cellular up to organismal level in a small nervous system. So that's the, uh, that's the motivation here. This is what the output looks like. So this is a worm crawling around. Um, you can see the head on the top left here. It's lighter than the rest. Um, you can see that worms move forwards. Uh, they also make turns. And you can see a sort of long, awkward reversal here that this worm does. And this is very important for worms. This is, of course, how they navigate their environment. It's how they find uh, food. But it's also very important for geneticists, or has been uh, historically. Um, and that's because when you mutagenize worms, you often get a sort of clear, visible phenotype. So on the left, uh, this is a mutant called unc 9 So this is a case where um, this gene has been uh, essentially deleted, or at least has been made non-functional. And it has a very clear effect on the worm. So this is the worm. It's trying to crawl. See, it's not really able to propagate those smooth waves down its body that the wild type does. Well, you can see it's still able to lay eggs. Just saw an egg pop out there. Um, and this is very useful for geneticists, because what this means is that if you have a mixed plate, you have some mutants, you have some non-mutants, uh, you're able to pick these out vis uh, visually and pick them to a new plate, and that allows you to sort of use all of the tools of classical genetics to study what's going on. But these days, uh, we are able to make quite specific perturbations. So we can uh, delete a gene of interest just based on its sequence. And that's something that was done in the case uh, on the right. So this is a worm where the gene called TRIP4 has been deleted from the worm. And you would hope to have some sort of clear effect that helps you, as I say, sort of study its function. But in this case, there was really no obvious effect at all. Um, but we still want to understand what TRIP4 is doing. Um, and so it's important to try to identify some kind of phenotype. Now, in this case, it turned out that uh, these TRIP4 deletion mutants actually have a deeper body bend. So you can see a kind of higher curvature along the body in this worm than the wild type, but it's relatively subtle. Um, but still, that was a useful starting point for uh, studying this gene and was important to figure out its function as a mechanosensitive ion channel that plays a role in the worm's sense of body position. So the question that we uh, sort of started with and that I started with when I sort of came into the worm field was how could we detect these kinds of important but subtle uh, phenotypes? This is something I started working on in Bill Schaefer's lab. And uh, there, uh, Ev Yamini had built this uh, single worm tracking system. Um, it consists of a USB microscope that you can see here. Uh, it's mounted on a motorized stage. So you have this sort of X and Y control with the light source on top. And the worms sit on this plate uh, in the middle. Ev wrote some software so that we can uh, automatically track these worms around the plate as they move and use that to generate uh, fairly large data sets. Uh, so because Ev took care to make these relatively inexpensive, it was possible to uh, buy several of them. We sort of had a multiplex setup. We had eight running in the lab at the same time. And uh, Laura Grundy, who was a technician in Bill's lab, spent uh, a couple of years working very intensively on this and collected 12,000 videos uh, from 350 different worm strains. So each of these 12,000 videos is about 15 minutes long. Um, so it's really quite a uh, rich behavioral data set that we have to deal with. Because it's so large, we can't really watch it. Uh, it's not something you would sit down and watch. So instead, we try to automatically extract useful uh, behavioral parameters. The first step is segmentation, just figuring out what is worm and what is background. Uh, because the image quality is relatively good, um, this is not so difficult to do. Basically, worms are dark, background is light. And so a simple threshold does a very good job of uh, picking out worm pixels. Uh, we then get the uh, outline of that shape and look for the points of highest curvature on the outline. And uh, those two points represent the head and the tail. And then we just draw the midline, which you can see is the colored line down the worm body here. And um, that basically is what we're going to use to represent the worm behavior. Because worms don't change length or width very much during behavior, basically the bends of those um, midline shapes over time are a nearly complete representation of uh, the motor behavior, although there are some things that we potentially missed, like egg laying that I showed you before. 
All right, so we have these uh, skeletons over time. That's not necessarily much better than uh, just watching the videos, though. So we also wanted to uh, sort of do a further processing step and extract interesting features, things that we thought might be relevant for the worm behavior. Uh, we basically just, what I would say is kind of directly parameterize the behavior in a way. So all I mean is that we measured everything we could think of uh, that we might want to from a worm. So that means things like uh, the morphology, how wide is it at different parts of its body, what is its length, its area. Uh, we also measure aspects of the crawling wave, which you can see represented here in the bottom left. We measure how fast the worms move. Um, because we have relatively high resolution, we can also do things like look at the change in bend angle along different parts of the body, so we can quantify that curvature. And we can also detect the frequency of predefined behaviors. So for example, this uh, sort of head swinging that's often called foraging in the worm community, we can also detect the frequency of reversals or of sharp turns, uh, often called omega turns. Basically, we just put all of these measures into a uh, vector, and then we say which of these are good at distinguishing uh, mutants from the wild type. So that would be in a way of sort of finding examples like I talked about before with TRIP4, where there's some subtle difference in a feature. And when we did that on those a uh, little bit over 300 mutants, um, out of the 76 mutants from that set that had no previously reported phenotype, we always found at least one feature that was different. So we're very sensitive at distinguishing uh, wild type worms from um, mutant worms. That's just sort of summarized here. Um, what you can see on the left are the uncoordinated worms. So these are like that video that I showed on the left before, uh, all of these strains on the left. These have very obvious defects in their behavior. And what you're seeing in this plot is uh, a sort of summary of those features I'm talking about. So each column is one of the features. So this could be uh, you know, speed, for example. It could be the different worm length along the columns. And along the rows is, uh, each row is a, a mutant worm. So this would be a horizontal row here, sort of a summary of how that worm behaves and how it's different from the wild type. The colors represent those differences. So things that are blue are significantly uh, less than the wild type. Things that are red are significantly greater than the wild type. And on the left, for these uncoordinated worms, you see essentially everything is different. So these worms are very obviously different from the wild type. On the right, we have those 76 mutants I was talking about where the differences are more subtle. So these are worms where people had made these uh, mutant strains, but the differences were relatively small, not clearly visible by eye. And you can see there are more white squares on the right, which basically just means there are more things which are not different between these worms and the wild type, which you'd expect for this kind of subtle difference. Uh, but still, every row has at least one or two colored squares, which means we're always able to find at least a couple of differences between these worms and, uh, and the wild type. And those provide sort of useful starting points for um, geneticists who are trying to understand the function of these genes. Um, and they're also potentially useful for something like the open worm project. So this would be one possible method of comparing the output of the worm simulation to uh, real worms. It essentially include a simulated worm as a row in this in this matrix, and you can see what is different between that uh, simulated worm and the wild type. So that's that's one method of uh, sort of quantifying these differences. Okay, uh, Andre, I yeah. don't remember. Um, were a selection of um, putatively wild type lines from different labs included in this data set, and did they consistently or fairly consistently fail to show any phenotype? Because one wonders, of course, if um, if you just always see differences due to background, um, even if it's, it, uh, you know, not necessarily the gene um, doing it. Yes, uh, we do see, uh, so we have looked at a couple of other um, nominally wild type strains or other people's sort of versions of N2, uh, and we do detect consistent differences. So there is certainly going to be, you know, some of these differences that you see represented here are not due to the gene that we know is deleted, but due to something present in the background. Um, that's a likely source of, probable source of differences between the, the N2 strains from different labs. So yes, absolutely, we see, we do see differences between those, those different worms. Um, so when interpreting these differences, the fact that a mutant where we know a gene is deleted shows a difference is really only um, a hint that maybe that gene is involved because there's all kinds of stuff in the background. Uh, so that's that's definitely an important caveat. One other question quickly, Andre. Um, I don't remember either. The uncoordinated mutants, are these, when you, when these were selected, are they just defined as onc by people previously, or how, how are they, 
How did you define them as uncoordinated? Yeah, so these, these are all genes that are, they're all mutants that are called unc, um, or they are eggle worms that are well known to be uncoordinated as well as eggle. Egg, eggle is egg laying defective. Okay, so some of the mutants without obvious phenotypes could be mild unks, but just were not classified as such yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and in fact, I mean, the, the, uh, the fact that they do show these differences in locomotion, uh, I mean, you could interpret that as being mild unk. I mean, they, they have differences in their spontaneous locomotion. Thanks. Okay, so that's, a, that's one method of sort of summarizing uh, the behavior, but it doesn't really get at the question I started with, which was, uh, this idea of um, maybe a more sort of generic representation which will help us uh, understand behavior in, in maybe a more more general way, a non-worm specific way, something we hope might generalize. Um, so then we sort of come to this question, well, what is, what is behavior? What are we trying to measure? Um, my personal favorite definition is the one put forward by Nico Tinbergen, uh, sort of a, a pioneer in the field of ethology, the sort of study of animal behavior. And he defined behavior simply as the total movements made by the intact animal. I like this definition because it's very easy to understand. It's very simple. Um, and I think it also captures um, everything we would really want to know about behavior. But it really raises its own question. So for example, how do we capture a complete repertoire of behavior? How complex is the repertoire? You know, how, how are we going to deal with this sort of list of the total movements made by the animal? So that's what I'd like to talk about for the rest. Uh, just one approach um, that we are taking to, to think about this problem of behavioral representation. Um, another point that I think is maybe useful to make is that sometimes a systematic characterization is useful. But C. elegans, there's certainly a long history of this, uh, sequencing the genome, a sort of you know, systematic characterization of the genes. Um, we also have the cell lineage in the case of uh, C. elegans, sort of the complete lineage from a single cell up to the adult, all of the divisions that, that go into making the worm. And of course, also, again, very familiar for open worm is that we have the connectome, or the sort of complete, relatively complete characterization of the connections between neurons in the nervous system. Um, so again, I think there's a lot to be learned just by this sort of systematic characterization and, and quantitative description. So that's what we're going to do. Um, there are a few features that we wanted for our uh, behavioral representation. One of those was some kind of quantitative distance measure. So we wanted to be able to say, uh, Sort of quantitatively, how similar two behaviors are to each other. Not just that there is a difference or not, but that this one is more different uh, than another. We also wanted the ability to recognize sub-behaviors. So what I mean by that is that we can recognize that uh, sometimes behaviors are nested within each other. Uh, so if I make a reaching motion, for example, that's a motion that I could make while I'm typing at my computer or while I am drinking a cup of coffee. Those might be done in different contexts, but the reaching behavior is sort of a sub-behavior that's repeated. I wanted to be able to recognize that regardless of the surrounding context. And then the last thing we wanted was uh, a flexible time warping. Um, all I mean by that is um, I, wanted my <clears throat> I wanted my representation to be able to distinguish, uh, for example, a reaching motion that's done either quickly or slowly. So that was something we wanted in there. Uh, we tried a lot of different uh, things. Um, but the one we ended up settling on after a few different approaches was this one where we start with the midline shapes I was talking about. So this is just those, those skeletons along the midline of the worm. Uh, we put those in a sort of high dimensional space. If you imagine that the midline is defined as a uh, angle, oops, sorry, an angle at each part uh, along the worm, that could be a coordinate uh, in one dimension. So if we have each angle being a different dimension, then every worm shape is just a point in a high dimensional space. What we then do is what's called k-means clustering. It's basically just a way of finding a set of representative shapes in that high dimensional space where we set the number of clusters that we want. We tried several different numbers of clusters, and we found that 90 different clusters gave a what we felt was a good balance between uh, the sort of accuracy of the representation and still keeping it relatively simple so that we weren't overwhelmed with you know, 5,000 different shapes. So this is what those 90 sort of representative worm shapes look like. On the top left, you see the most common of those postures. And you can see that they're relatively uh, sort of sinusoidal looking. There's, these are basically shapes associated with normal worm crawling. The least common ones are the ones that are down on the bottom right here. Uh, so you can see here we start to get uh, sharper turns, which are, of course, important behaviors, um, but uh, less common. And you also see some others that are relatively flat and straight. These are uh, also relatively rare compared to locomotion. 
but these correspond to uh, sort of pausing behavior. Sometimes when the worm is not moving very much, it takes on this sort of flat posture. The way we use this to represent the dynamics is um, by basically tiling a sequence of continuous shapes with a representative. So what I mean by that is uh, if we look at this sequence here, we have uh, the original data in black. Um, these are the worm shapes over time. At each moment, we say which of those 90 uh, postures is closest to the current shape. And we just do that uh, the whole way along. You can see sometimes the fit is relatively good. Other times, it's less good. So in this case, this is the best match between that shape and the uh, uh, template, but it's not perfect. So we're losing a little bit of uh, representation there, but that was what we uh, wanted to sacrifice to have this sort of simple, compact representation. Okay. So once we yeah, go ahead. You, you mentioned that you noticed that some positions are more common than others. Do you do any weighting in your classification to account for this? Uh, do we do any weighting? So the we don't do an explicit weighting, uh, but if there are, you know, if we're asking for the k-means to return 90 postures, if there are some re regions of the uh, space that are very densely populated with shapes, they will tend to have more uh, cluster centers associated with them. So the, the weighting is sort of inherent in uh, the k-means. We'll have sort of a non-uniform sampling of the space, which is based on the, on the density, the, the probability of having a shape there if that makes sense. He's signaling yeah. yes. <laughs> OK, yeah, sorry, I can't, I can't see anyone. Uh, yeah. OK, so um, in this representation now, so once, once we've sort of assigned a template to each position, we just give it a label. So each of those 90 postures has a number associated with it. And so this little bout of behavior that you see represented just becomes the sequence of states 3, 89, 5, 87, et cetera. We also get that time warping I was talking about in a very, very simple way, where we simply ignore uh, repeats. So you can see, in this case, posture 3 happened at two frames in a row. Posture 89 happened once. Posture 5 happened, uh, it looks like, about five times. Um, but we just sort of collapse all of those. We get rid of those repeats, and we still just consider the sequence 3, 89, 5, et cetera. That means that whether the behavior is done quickly or slowly, we will still recognize that as uh, a match in this representation. So Andre, I was wondering if you could um, maybe explain a little bit as to why you decided to do the time warping as opposed to just having repeating numbers. Um, so been, I, not necessarily been, but for that long stretch where 87 is occurring, for example, in this slide, you just had a bunch of repeats with 87. And you could have still followed up with the same kind of um, pattern dictionary compression that you do afterwards. So yeah, why did you decide to do the time warping? Yeah, and of course, you, you don't have to. Um, you, you could do all the same analysis, including repeats, um, which has some advantages. For example, it uh, will include rate information, which is real information. I mean, there is a difference between a slow and a fast behavior, I understand. Um, but what we want to, so we, what basically what we're doing, we're, we're trying to, I guess, have it both ways in a way, where we initially collapse the sequence. We find these uh, repeated patterns. Um, but we, we maintain a record of the duration of each of those. We also have the sort of distribution of times in the repeats. Um, so we, will, we can sort of go back and, and uh, ask how quickly the different behaviors were done on average. Basically, um, if you look for relatively short sequences, uh, which is desirable sort of computationally, you don't want to necessarily have to consider uh, very long uh, sequences. If you stick to short sequences, it's nice not to have repeats, because, for example, the frequent behaviors become dominated by repeats if you let them stay in. So you know, in this sequence, for example, the sequence 87, 87, 87 uh, would happen multiple times. And that might actually be the only, uh, well, other, than, other than repeats, those might be the only repeated patterns here. So we didn't want to focus. You end up focusing, I think, a bit too much on repeats if you leave them in. But it's, it's a matter of uh, yeah, uh, taste, you could almost say. Uh, there, there are reasons. Thank you. OK. Um, right, OK, so that's the representation. Uh, the first thing we did was just think a little bit about the statistics of these. And so what we did was we just counted um, the different variety of repeats that we saw. So this is sort of getting at that question um, that I uh, was talking about a second ago of how do we kind of quantify the full repertoire. Now that we have this very, very sort of simple, compact representation, we could say that the full repertoire of the behavior is obtained simply by counting the full variety of sequences that you see. Um, just to give you a bit of uh, nomenclature here, uh, I'm calling a 2-gram or bigram 
uh, any sequence of two postures in a row, or a three gram or trigram, any sequence of three postures, etc. So a four gram is any sequence of four postures. And we can look at the statistics of these. So if we just focus on the uh, three grams here, that's this line um, second from the top. And uh, what we wanted to do was plot this sort of frequency distribution. So on the bottom, I have the rank. Uh, so the most common trigram is on the left with a rank of one. And these get uh, towards the right progressively rarer and lower ranks. And the uh, y-axis here is just the actual frequency. So you can see that the most common uh, trigram happens uh, a little bit less than uh, 1 in 100 times, something like 1 in one in 2 or 300 uh, sequences is that most common uh, sequence. The reason we're plotting it this way is that this is something uh, that people do in language. Uh, so this is the same sort of plot for uh, English, where here you have uh, word frequencies. And we have the rank on the bottom again. So we have the most common word on the left, which would be the which happens roughly 1 in 10 words. And then you get this uh, sort of characteristic power law decay, which is called Zipf's law, Zipf's law when talking about uh, language. And we thought this was an interesting way to sort of draw this analogy between uh, worms and language. Now, I'm not arguing that we have a power law here in the case of the worm behavior, but uh, we do have a sort of heavy tail distribution. All I mean is that we have a relatively small number of extremely highly represented um, trigrams, and a much, much larger number of rare sequences, which is familiar if you think uh, from language, where we have a sort of core vocabulary of maybe 1,000 or 2,000 words, which is enough to read the newspaper. But there are many more words in the dictionary that we use sort of rarely to express particular ideas or, or emotions. How am I doing for time? I should probably speed up a bit. Hey, Stephen, can you? Uh, well, you're, uh, let's see, we're, so we're 30 minutes in, and um, um, we can continue in about, you know, like another 15, 20, I think, uh, and open it up for yeah. questions. If we go a little bit longer than that, I think we'll be OK. But yeah. Yeah, sounds good. OK. Great. OK, so that's sort of the overall statistics. But we also wanted to ask, you know, specifically, what can we learn from the sequence of these uh, postures, which I'm calling the syntax, just sort of, again, an analogy with, with language. So if we think, consider a simple English sentence, we can start looking at the uh, two grams or bigrams in this sentence. One thing you'd notice is that uh, if you're looking at a large corpus of English, phrases like to go would be very common. These would come up again and again. But the reason they're common is really just a property of the English language um, that to and go often go together. It doesn't really tell you anything about the outside world. In contrast, words like Italian restaurant uh, would also be relatively commonly co-occurring. And that would be because there is something out in the outside world that's called an Italian restaurant. So that, that is giving you some, some useful information. So what we wanted to know was which of the repeats that we see in the worm postures are of these sorts of categories. You know, which ones are, let's say, trivial repeats, and which ones are more interesting. So we thought the way to uh, highlight these would be to think about which behaviors are actually under control in some sense. So how do worms uh, adapt in response to stimuli? which of these sequences change. And then we also wanted to think about what changes over uh, sort of short evolutionary times. So what's different between closely related strains of worms? So I think I'll, I'll skip the second part, but I'll just say uh, briefly about the uh, stimuli. So we looked at worms in three different conditions. We have worms that are crawling around on food. So this is just the, what I'm plotting here is just the center of mass uh, of the worms over time. So this is just sort of the track of worms on their patch of food. They tend not to leave food, so this is a relatively small uh, area. We also looked at worms off food. And in this case, they explore a much larger area because they're trying to find something to eat. Uh, and then the third condition we considered was also off food, but there was, in this case, a chemoattractant. So worms had a tendency, in this case, to go roughly up, which was towards that attractive chemical that we put on the plate. And we just wanted to ask what was, what was different in these cases. So what we did was uh, to basically compile a complete list of all of the trigrams that we saw in all of the conditions. So this is a long list of you know, more than 10,000 of these postural uh, sequences that we observed across all the worms and all the conditions. And then we just ask which ones have different frequencies in the different conditions. Uh, and here are just four examples of some of the differences we saw. So you can see uh, on the left, here is a sequence which is um, uh, very common. So the rank is shown as these red numbers here. So it's the most common behavior during chemotaxis. It's the most common behavior off food. And it's the seventh most common on food. So common in all cases, but uh, differently common. So it's more frequent during chemotaxis. And if we look at what that behavior is, 
you can see it's just sort of a short bout of forward locomotion. So it makes sense that that's more common during uh, chemotaxis because that is a uh, sort of characterized by more persistent forward motion. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting here is if you look at the second behavior, uh, there's actually overlap in terms of the postures. So the, the first and third postures in the case of uh, this second uh, sequence here is the same posture as the first one in the first sequence. But now it's in a different context. So instead of being in the context of forward locomotion, that posture is in the context of a pause. So it just goes uh, that posture, there's a bend to the left here, and then it goes back to that posture. And that change in context, or, or syntax, I would say, uh, leads to a very, very different uh, outcome in terms of the frequency. So now it's the 1800th most common behavior during chemotaxis, so quite a rare behavior, uh, the 1100th most common off food, and the 87th on food. So it's, it's uh, really changed the, the frequency that this occurs, and again, we still see that there are still differences in uh, the frequency. It's more common on food, which again is consistent with the fact that they spend more time dwelling on food. Um, so although it's, I think, quite interesting, I'll skip this discussion of comparing different wild isolates. This is just worms from different parts of the world. Um, and move on to the uh, actual subject of the Journal Club, uh, which is basically a method of prioritizing these sequences. So what I was just talking about is basically um, exhaustively counting all of the variety of these short sequences that we see. And that could be useful because it's unbiased, but it requires a very large number of comparisons, especially if we start to count larger uh, sequences than just three. So we wanted a method of prioritizing behaviors. You know, how do we try to uh, extract the potentially interesting behaviors without uh, necessarily knowing what we're looking for? Um, the analogy I would draw here is to uh, exome sequencing, for those familiar with genomics. Here the idea is that instead of sequencing an entire genome, where you get you know, the sequence of every single nucleotide, you only sequence the genes, and you leave out the stuff between the genes. And in the case of humans, um, the stuff between the genes is actually much, uh, a much larger number of bases than the, uh, the genes themselves, and so it's a way of sort of focusing on what we think might be the more interesting regions of the genome. So how would we do something similar to that in the case of behavior, focusing on what we think might be the interesting behaviors when we don't have a sort of analogy of the genetic code? So we, we don't really have very much prior information for what would be an interesting behavior. So what we decided to do was to think about uh, a compression algorithm. And the, uh, the basic sort of premise of this is that uh, if you know something about a sequence, if you're able to extract useful information, uh, that information that you know can be used in, in compression. And so something that gives you good compression sort of reflects, in some sense, uh, good knowledge of a sequence. So the approach, if we just take this sort of uh, toy sequence here of just uh, ones and twos, is to identify those useful patterns. So one approach might be to think about the longest repeat. So in this sequence here, you see there's quite a long repeat of uh, ones and twos. Um, that might give us good compression if we replace that with a, new, uh, with a new token. We sort of add that to our dictionary, and we just replace it with a new state. Uh, another option for replacement would be the most frequent. That would also be something that might give us good compression. Uh, but there's a third option, which is the most compressive. So that is, out of all of the possible replacements we could make, the most compressive sequence is the one that gives us the largest total reduction in the sequence, taking into account the size of the dictionary. Um, so if we make that replacement, we make a dictionary entry where we say this 3 actually corresponds to or represents the sequence 1, 2, 1. So now we have a uh, one entry in our dictionary, and we have a new compressed sequence where we've made the replacements uh, that are defined by that rule. We can do that again, um, in this case making the replacement of um, 4 going to 3, 2, 2, 3, and we get an even shorter sequence. So this is sort of the, uh, the core idea. It's relatively simple. We just want to make these replacements that give us the most uh, compression. The idea is that we're balancing something that is, should be both frequent as well as long. We're Andre, trying to find material. Yeah. I'll have a quick question here. And maybe it's yeah. just the example that you're going. So in the algorithm that you guys are using, how come it picks 3223 two, instead of 3322? Two, three, two, two? Like if I think of regular expressions, it usually starts, it's like it's greedy, it starts at the beginning. And we grab that. Yes. Yeah, so it's uh, it's simply, so there's there's no, we have no preference, right? So whenever we, for every iteration, there could be equally ranked out, uh, uh, replacements. And so in the case that you say this 3322 would work equally well. Um, 
we take uh, 3, 2, 2, 3 in this case simply because it has a, if we order them uh, in uh, ascending order, it comes first. And so it just, it just happens that as part of the algorithm, we end up uh, sorting these, and we just take the one that occurs first. So you could either take the one that occurs first in the sequence uh, or the uh, one that occurs first in the, the sorted list, and we happen to take the one that occurs first in the sorted list, but there's no reason to put one over the other. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and we can also represent this sort of uh, dictionary construction in uh, a graphic way, which we do with these arc diagrams. So all you see here is just the uh, different repeated subsequences that we see uh, being connected to each other as they occur uh, in the sequence, and we also try to capture some of that nesting structure that we have. This is what it actually looks like on uh, worm sequences. So rather than those sort of thick uh, repeated chunks that you saw uh, in the toy example, here the repeats tend to be quite a lot uh, smaller. And that's because, essentially, worms are not extremely repetitive over a very long time. So if we just look at a worm for 15 minutes, it's not going to do, you know, kind of a, a three-minute chunk of identical behavior at uh, two different times. So it's, it has a uh, sort of intermediate complexity, I would say. Um, you can see that it's not only because of uh, just sort of random chance repeats. There is real structure there, because if we shuffle the sequence, so we just take that t same sequence with the same probability of different states, but we destroy the temporal order, we just randomly shuffle, then we get far fewer uh, repeats. Hey, Andre, wait, so if you can go back real quick, just this, uh, this uh, diagram. Yeah, OK, right. So uh, I think uh, when you went from the, um, the blocks of uh, hmm. The solid to the lines. I think I got lost. So is the line pointing to the from the from the first part of the sequence to the last part of the sequence, or the middle? Um, like I'm just getting confused. This one's shaded, and the other one uh, just has lines. So oh, uh, you, you mean this one has only lines? Yeah, yeah. So they they are actually they're they're not lines. They they do reflect the width of the repeated pattern, but they look like lines because the repeats are not very long. Oh, wow, OK. So some it. of those are slightly fatter than the others uh, because they represent slightly longer repeats, but they are, compared to the length of that sequence, they are very short. OK, so just like for that largest arc there, the tallest arc that's most prominent there, can you just like just say in words like what exactly that, what, like what, we, what you interpret from that um, on there in terms of where it touches? So there is a sequence at the one end of the arc and a sequence at the other end of the arc, and they're the same? Is that, yes. That's the yeah. And the reason that's a tall arc is because that's a relatively rare sequence. So in this case, it only happened twice. So we only connect those one repeats. So the very frequent repeats are happening in these, these sort of short arcs, where if, you know, if something is repeated you know, 10 or 20 times, it's going to be connected uh, 10 times in sort of these bouncing arcs as, as you connect up all the different repeats. OK. And so the... Um, so whether it's the same sequence or a different sequence is, is not reflected in this because they're all kind of the same color. So in some cases, some of the arcs are for the same sequence, and in others, they're for different. But we're not seeing that in this picture, right? That's Yes, that's right. Yeah. OK, OK, got it. Perfect. But Thank you. Would, would they still be connected in this, in this figure like they were in the previous one, like how 1, 2, 1 was connected several times? So if they like bounce down to the... Um, horizontal line, and then they come up at the same point, that would be the same. That's right. Yes, exactly. So if you zoom in here, then you'll see that there are some that are repeated you know, maybe five or ten times, and, and those will be arcs. So if we just go back here, those will be arcs that connect. You know, They overlap at this at this point and sort of bounce along. So that is represented in the, in the next uh, image as well. Uh, OK, so another way of representing this. Uh, so I think you know, all, all we really draw from this is this sort of, you know, basically qualitative idea that worm, worms have intermediate complexity. You know, there are quite a lot of repeats. It's, it's more structured than a random sequence, certainly, but there aren't very long chunks of, of perfectly repeated behaviors. Uh, yeah, we can also then sort of zoom in and see uh, or, or extract some of the sequences that we do see. Uh, so this was the most uh, compressive sequence overall. It's this uh, bout of forward locomotion, happened 80 times. Um, but we can also look at these more nested patterns. So the uh, total behavior that you see here happened five times in total, but it's composed of sort of you know underlying repeats uh, that are that are uh, sort of sequenced together in in different ways in different contexts. 
So it actually contains that most compressive behavior at the top is contained as a sub-behavior in this highly nested structure. But in some cases, that very common uh, behavior happened you know, 20 times with this other posture. It happened 12 times with both of these postures together and five times in that overall sequence. Uh, and this is just meant to sort of illustrate and, and capture this intuition about nesting of behavior that we have, where we have um, behaviors sort of nested inside of other behaviors. It's a little bit like phrases uh, constructed into paragraphs, into chapters, uh, et cetera. We wanted to sort of capture something about that and see, see what there is to see. Uh, to give a little bit of intuition what I mean by sort of intermediate complexity, we can compare it to something where we, where we have a feeling for how repetitive the sequence is. So I also uh, applied it to uh, Moby Dick. Uh, this is just the text of the first chapter of the novel Moby Dick, uh, or, or maybe a portion of the first chapter. Uh, and you can see the sort of level of, of repeats. So you see some things that are uh, slightly fatter than what we saw before, which represent slightly longer repeats. Um, but overall, you see that prose has a somewhat similar complexity to worm behavior, spontaneous worm behavior. Uh, we can focus in on a few examples of repeated things. So for example, whenever happens a few times. And you can also see that whenever I find myself happens a few times. If you look at the red and the yellow arcs, you can see that whenever followed by I find myself happens a couple of times. OK, we can sort of ramp up the structure. So we can look at a poem that is a sort of intermediate complexity in terms of its um, uh, repetitiveness. Uh, so it's slightly less complex, I guess you would say. It's slightly more repetitive. This is the raven. Um, and again, you see now sort of larger chunks with uh, some recognizable repeating patterns. And we can also look at a pop song. So this is Shake It Off by Taylor Swift. This is something where we expect uh, still more strongly repetitive structure because it has choruses. And you can see these two choruses here. The third instance of the chorus is actually slightly different, which is why you don't have that sort of perfect repeat. But you have things like uh, I'm just going to shake, 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 something you'd expect to come out of this song. You've also got Irv's gonna. That's because we have both haters that are going to hate. Uh, and uh, what else do we have? some other errs uh, that are also going to do something. And you see that structure reflected here. OK. So what are the... can I, uh, sorry to interrupt again, but I have a question. If you maybe can go back one slide. Oops, this uh, one? Uh, Moby Dick or the Raven, either of these examples. The Raven's actually a really great one. So okay. uh, although the Raven is probably more repetitive than the worm behavior from what you're, you're presenting in your paper, um, I'm, so when you're showing us the hierarchical worm behaviors um, mm. or the hierarchical histograms, those, I, I think from my understanding of it, those must happen in that exact order. What about a case like this, at my chamber door and nothing more? There's a relationship between these two, mm -hmm. temporally, but there's a gap between them that is not going to be the same. It's going to be different each time. How, yeah. do you, how can, can your algorithm, or can you modify this algorithm to be able to pick those um, related relationships up as well? Yeah, so you'd have two options, basically. One would be to have the algorithm allow for uh, partial matches. Uh, so you could sort of tolerate a certain number of uh, errors. Uh, and the other thing would be to first construct the dictionary and then uh, you know, use some other approach, uh, I mean, in this case, just visually, um, to see how the elements of the dictionary relate to each other, so where you might see that what, what you can see you know, is at my chamber door followed by a nothing more. You know, it happens, happens twice, as you say. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, not, it's not in the dictionary construction. We only allow perfect matches. But you, you could, in principle, take it into account in another way. And do you think, um, from looking at uh, the amount of the worm seagrams you've looked at, that this happens with the worm behavior? Um, I think it probably happens at a, um, at a very local level where if you, um, you know, tolerated sort of one or two posture mismatches, you could find some, well, you would necessarily find some larger nesting patterns because you would, you would, you would tolerate those. Whether they are you know, significant in the sense of important for um, explaining differences between strains, uh, I, I really can't say because we haven't tried. But it, it would be interesting to try. Yeah, and I guess you could imagine in the first case, if you said, like, you allow for partial matches, you could implement this similar to how they do with when you're aligning DNA sequences or protein sequences and have a gap penalty. So you can yeah. have write an algorithm, then you can adjust the gap penalty and see how how well or how poorly it worked. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, that was one of our motivations for 
going to a discrete representation was to take advantage of methods from bioinformatics, methods from natural language processing, uh, and sort of import them into um, our discussions of worm behavior. Um, so I think there are lots of really cool possibilities there. We, we just haven't done them yet. <laughs> um, OK, so if you remember what I showed before, where we were sort of picking, um, I was just showing you those differences in trigram frequencies when we were comparing these three conditions. Remember, we're comparing worms off food uh, to these other conditions. Um, we just focused on those length three behaviors, but there's not really um, a very strong reason to do that. Uh, there are some longer sequences that are potentially interesting. Uh, one of the challenges, though, is that uh, very long sequences, th th there's a very large variety of long sequences, which makes it um, a little bit harder to deal with, uh, for example, all sequences of length eight, because there's a very large number of them. So what we thought instead was we would try our dictionary elements for making these um, comparisons. So if instead of comparing all sequences of a given length, or all sequences of all lengths up to 10 in this case, if we just focused on those sort of sequences that ended up in our dictionary, what would happen? And um, what I'm showing here in the bottom right is the probability that a given sequence shows a significant difference between one of those conditions um, when you're considering all of the possible sequences or you're considering those sequences that end up in one of our dictionaries or in one of our grammars. And what you see here is that if you consider all of the n-grams, then the probability that that behavior is sort of modulated between uh, one of these conditions is relatively low, and it also drops off uh, quite quickly. Um, whereas for the sequences that end up in the dictionary, there is a reasonable probability, you know, up around 20%, even for the long sequences, that they will be different in the uh, different conditions. So what we think is that essentially this um, idea of, you know, focusing on the exome of behavior or focusing on these, these uh, both long and relatively frequent sequences gives us a way to sort of prioritize sequences that are potentially interesting. And it actually turns out that those are also modulated between um, conditions. Um, here are just some examples. Uh, so some things that you might not find if you were just counting, um, you know, for example, focusing on the frequent behaviors or, or trying to count everything. Uh, we see some rare behaviors that come up in the dictionary that are still quite interesting. So for example, on the top right, we have this very long reversal. So that's a quite a long sequence of states, but it is uh, differently used in those different conditions. Uh, we also see you know, sort of compound behavior. So the bottom left is a pirouette, which is sort of a reversal followed by a turn, which is coming out in the um, compressive dictionary and it is modulated between the conditions. So we thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I think I will, I better stop there, actually. So that's maybe one of the, the points here is that this algorithm highlights these uh, rare but potentially interesting or potentially informative behaviors. Um, and let me just uh, acknowledge some of those people that uh, I worked with. So on the left here, these are people in the current group uh, at Imperial. Um, but today I talked really about the work uh, that I did with uh, Roland Schwartz, who helped with uh, some language modeling in the uh, earlier part. And the compression work was done with uh, Alex, who is with us and also uh, Greg Stevens at uh, the VU in Amsterdam. So uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity. And uh, why don't we yeah, talk some more? I can switch Great. back to my camera now, I guess, or well, maybe I'll have to switch back and forth. Great. So um, I have a question to start off, and I hope other guys uh, do as well. So um, just coming off of the last uh, journal club, so um, and uh, if, if you're not familiar with, um, with it, um, essentially uh, um, Saul Cato and collaborators have been um, looking at the neural activity across multiple, uh, you know, multiple, multiple neurons and um, uh, doing the first thing that uh, makes sense, which is to do some principal components analysis on it over, uh, over uh, time, and then looking at the um, phase plot of the first three principal components. And uh, one of the things that he's uh, done there is uh, to try and uh, give a label to different um, loops in this uh, manifold in three space uh, that he shows up. Uh, and uh, he's kind of uh, got a, um, a picture that uh, I can maybe bring up if, uh, if we want to discuss it, but essentially it has a breakdown of behaviors where there's like moving forward, there's moving backwards, um, there's some places where there's 
sort of uh, a few different kinds of reversals. Um, and so I'm wondering if um, potentially what you have put together here um, in this much more detailed form of uh, behavior uh, could be connected uh, with that to get more specific about the kinds of behaviors that appear in a particular bend of this uh, manifold. Um, and um, yeah, if, if somehow putting those two data sets together um, would be uh, would pr potentially lead to even more insight. Um, so yeah, just sort of a general question. Uh, I think they're really complementary. Uh, I think the data that they have so far is uh, primarily from the restrained worms. And so the way they're connecting neural activity to behavior right now is based on um, uh, the sort of patterns that they see in a selection of single neurons during free behavior and connecting that with what they see in the restrained worm. So it's difficult to say you know, those, how those differences in neural activity might translate into very subtly different uh, behaviors, but of course people are working on combining the imaging with free behavior. Um, I think one of the interesting things, I guess, from that paper is that they do see this broad connection, you know, between these different behavioral states and, and what you intuitively see in the worm in terms of forwards and backwards. Um, and there are, of course, many different ways of going forwards, and you know, seeing the extent to which those are represented or are detectable in in you know subtly different patterns of neural activity. Uh, comparing that to behavior, I think would be would be very interesting. I think eventually it'll have to have to go that way, um, but it depends on exactly what you're trying to explain. So if you're trying to compare strains in from different genotypes or in different conditions, then sometimes these subtly different behaviors are very important. Um, if you're trying to explain the sort of you know broad patterns of neural activity, then maybe you want a coarser representation as they as they started with. But yeah, I, I think eventually they they should have to meet in some way, or I think it will be interesting to try to make them meet. Cool. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, the advantages and disadvantages of using compression as the method for um, finding these uh, sequences. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the alternatives include um, using uh, hidden Markov models where you have um, you, you keep adding internal state until it can explain a wider diversity of outputs. Um, and that can include internal states that force an animal to go through an exact sequence of behaviors, um, you know, you, because you just go into this thing and it produces this, that, and the other one. Um, or uh, if you wanted to take a more statistical approach, you could go in and, and basically do um, null hypothesis test testing saying, you know, all trigrams are made up of bigrams and anything that doesn't, uh, that gets a p-value that says, no, that's, that doesn't work, you say, okay, oh, well, this is a trigram, this is, this is something that happens, and then you can sort of build up your way um, that way to, to longer and longer. Uh, n grams, um, but the, there the metric is not specifically compressibility, but it's some um, some sort of metric of surprise. So I was wondering if you could say something about you know what you think the advantages and disadvantages of the methods are. Yeah, it's it's difficult to say because we haven't tried. I mean, it's basically we haven't tried very many other methods. We we sort of thought this method of compression was sort of the I don't know maybe the simplest first thing you might try. We have tried um, Markov models or sort of. Um, n-gram models, which are Markov models, commonly used in, in language. We, we did try that on the uh, sequences when I was first talking about them. Actually, on the well, maybe I won't bring it up. But on that um, rank frequency distribution plot, there were sort of lines overlaid that came from simulations of, of with a trigram model, so sort of a second order Markov model, which at least at the level of those statistics works pretty well. Uh, if you actually look at the sequence, you know, if you then sim simulate an instance of that Markov model, then you don't get very worm-like things. So it kind of captures the broad statistics, but doesn't produce a very convincing worm. I think a very interesting option might be more of a hierarchical Markov model, uh, where we allow for sort of, you know, broadly different states, which within them have some more specific states that are that are more, more or less probable. Uh, we have started working on that um, with uh, Oded Rashavi in uh, Tel Aviv. So we are thinking along those lines. I think that's a, yeah, a very interesting possibility. Um, other than the Markov modeling, though, we haven't tried others. So in terms of the advantages and disadvantages, um, it's a little bit hard to say. 
partly because I think we don't have great representations of behavior. So we always, in, in my mind, it's best sometimes to return to a problem you're trying to solve. So I would say that those would be considered better if they allow us to distinguish mutants, or they allow us to distinguish worms in different conditions, or maybe they allow us to distinguish differences in neural activity in a better way. That, that would sort of qualify as better. Uh, but really, it's too early for us to say. If I can add something to that, maybe one, one advantage that comes nearly for free by applying the compressibility method is that you get another thing, which is a scalar value of how much you can shrink your sequence. Uh, Andre didn't speak about that, but this is another, another parameter that we can use to phenotype. Uh, so basically, it says how much you can sh shrink it, and it turns out that this is um, it, you, can, you can think of it as, as the minimum description length principle, which is something physicists love, which is like you have a sequence, and then the, the maximum compression that you can apply on that sequence is, can be used as a definition of complexity. So by applying the compressibility, not only do we get these, these motifs, but we also get this number that then we can use to see how random the sequence is and also use it to phenotype. And there's another advantage to that, which is not so much um, in phenotyping, which is that biologically there's the question that whether how the brain is generating the behavior, and and it's thought that it's hierarchically generated, but it's really difficult to to demonstrate that from data. So uh, this is a big a bigger question I think that we are after. Can we provide evidence that the behavior, in this case of the worm, is not generated as a Markov process where you know you jump from this state to that state, but actually it comes in chunks and sub-chunks? So yeah, these are two important conceptual aspects that that this framework naturally incorporates. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe just since Alex brought it up, I'll just show, quickly show the plot. Um, this is, on the y-axis here, this is the compressibility. So that is kind of that single scalar number that we get out of the uh, analysis. Um, the x-axis here is the state duration. Uh, so essentially, um, this is sort of the inverse of speed. You know, So things that are on the right of the plot are slow. Things that are on the left are fast. Uh, one thing that came out that I thought is kind of interesting is that um, wild isolates that we look at, so for example, the Hawaiian strain uh, is known to be different from the uh, laboratory strain. So that's that CB4856 up here. Uh, and you can see it is um, more compressible than the lab strain, which means it's sort of more stereotyped, less complex. Um, people often think that the differences between N2 and Y are largely explained by loss of function of this neuropeptide receptor NPR1. Um, but that, you can see, is plotted down here. So although that does make the worms uh, faster, so they have a similar uh, state duration or speed to the Hawaiian strain, they don't have the same compressibility. So this mutant, although it's faster, is uh, more random than the wild isolate. And it looks more like the um, laboratory strain in terms of its randomness. So that was just an example of something we get from the compressibility that I thought was sort of um, uh, interesting. Interesting, and, and to me, at least surprising. So one question about that metric there. So it's compressibility per posture. I'm just trying to understand. Because I, I would think that uh, you'd take the entire, the entire sequence and you'd say, like, for a given run of a, of a worm, you could say, what's the compressibility of that whole run? So what is this? Uh, is that, that's different, though, than compressibility per posture, right? What is that? Uh, we are getting the compressibility of that whole run, but uh, we just want to take into account the fact that if you have uh, longer sequences, uh, they are just sort of intrinsically more compressible because you know, even, even a longer random sequence will be a bit more compressible because you'll just by chance have some more repeats. Um, so that's so a normalization. It's just a normalization. So we're just saying that that's roughly how compressible it is per posture. Did you look at the same thing as opposed um, um, as opposed to different strains? But um, did you look at compressibility in those three different conditions that you were showing there? Is like, is it more compressible to be like uh, looking for food or to be chemotaxing or? Yes. Yeah. So it's more compressible to be looking for food because you are spending more time moving in this sort of stereotyped pattern. You're trying to get somewhere. And that's a fairly repetitive gait, which which becomes compressible, or which is compressible. How how much more compressible is it? I don't know the number off the top of my head. Sorry, but noticeably more compressible. So it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting to say that like the nervous system is in some mode that is generating more of the same output when food is near than when it isn't. And um, 
it sort of intuitively makes sense, I guess. But, uh, you know, okay. Anyway. I think the, the way I think about it is that um, when, you have a, when you have a very clear goal, chances are there's going to be some sort of gate which for you is efficient. I mean, I hesitate to use optimal, but let's say, you know, kind of near optimal. You're, 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 at least you're, try, you're probably trying to be optimal in terms of your gate to get somewhere. You want to be efficient. So if you have a clear goal, then you're going to do something that's probably quite repetitive to get there. It would be like walking down a hallway with no obstacles in it. You're going to do a very repetitive, uh, stereotyped walking gait. Uh, whereas if you need to be flexible, then you're going to jump around. If you're if you're getting on the subway and it's a crowd of people, you're going to do some weird sort of skipping thing to get through the door and around the person, um, which will be much less stereotyped. So I think all basically what you're seeing is the worm makes some sort of reorientation when it's doing its search, but once it decides to go in a direction, it wants to cover some distance, and so it is sort of stereotyped and repetitive to try and get there efficiently. Hmm. So would, would you think that the less compressible it is, though, it might... Um be saying that we're seeing more, I, I mean, I, I, I think it just directly follows, but we're seeing more complex behavior, and therefore we're seeing maybe more of more potential states of the nervous system um, doing things? Does that, that seems to follow intuitively, but am I... Yeah, I think that's probably, that I think it's probably right. That, that's certainly, that would be my guess, for sure. And, and I think the, you know, among the most stereotyped behaviors are escape responses. So you're really driving the nervous system into a very particular state, which is get the hell out of here. And that also you see show up as more stereotyped uh, at the behavioral level. Yeah. So this is an interesting metric as well. If, if you would just put the hat on of, like, how, would you, how do you evaluate a simulation, which we've always thought that, like, this kind of tracking is, is obviously helpful. It'd be interesting to say, like, uh, you know, for the most compressible sequences, how well does your simulation do? And that kind of seems like potentially a lower bar. The less compressible that a sequence is, if you use it in comparison, is kind of like a higher bar. And you could almost say, like, you know, ramp up the quality of your simulation to get to less and less compressible sequences. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, without being noise. Yeah. So to capture those sequences that are less compressible but not fully random. Because, right. of course, a random sequence is kind of the minimally compressible uh, limit. Right. Um, Andre, I've got one question. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, so uh, I think that um, actually uh, simulation, open worm simulation with the uh, three environments that you have studied so far um, uh, in the paper, um, on food, off food, and um, hemotaxis um, sounds reasonable. But uh, I wonder whether we will find a sufficiently important difference between um, uh, structures in locomotion uh, for more complex environments um, because the two that two dimensional agar plates is still um, I mean it reduces uh, what's av available to the worm in terms of behavioral outputs and so I think that eventually I mean this is not a problem right now there are a lot of short term problems um, that you are working on but um, I wonder whether there are any ideas for uh, that potential problem in the future because let's say you've got a much more data rich environment which is much more complex and um, much more complex than say chemical gradients in an agar plate but the worm cannot necessarily display much more complexity than what it's what is possible in an agar plate um, and uh, I just wonder whether that question uh, has been considered or um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I th well, I guess we've considered it, but only in the sense of, you know, sort of thinking about it. Uh, we haven't really uh, done any experiments there. I think, yeah, I mean, what are the sort of limits of the... So when I talk about getting the complete repertoire of an animal, I mean, of course, in this context, all I mean is the uh, a complete record of the motions that it made on a two-dimensional agar plate. But the actual repertoire in nature, let's say, might be significantly more... Uh, almost is certainly significantly more complex. I mean, there are things that we know worms do that you will never see on a 2D agar plate. Uh, Dower larvae do this nictation, you know, where they, they sort of go up on a you know, fungus or any sharp thing and they wave back and forth. You know, that's a behavior that we would uh, never see on this 2D plate. Or swimming, you know, total difference in behavior. Um, I think there would be a lot of value in enriched environments for behavioral experiments. I think you'd see a lot more interesting uh, phenotypes and all that. Uh, 
it's just that there's a relatively limited number of things that you can do in a easy high throughput way. So some of the things, for example, that uh, Rex and I think also uh, Tiffany have done are you know things like plate taps or buzzing plates. You know that's a, a nice thing that you can do very systematic way on kind of all of your plates. Uh, you can do gas stimuli in a nice sort of easy high throughput way. Uh, blue light, which worms avoid. So th these are some of the things that I've been thinking about doing. Um, but it would be really fun to have a you know a little microfluidic chamber that had you know a swimming section and then you know you had some posts and then you had a chamber with Christianka Specificus there, a sort of, you know, death, death match chamber, and you could have all kinds of great stuff, and you'd see very interesting well, things. I mean, actually, we have some these videos there. They're amazing. That sounds cool. Actually, I've got, actually, this is sort of related, but earlier you were, uh, you mentioned that uh, you were looking for patterns in, say, the equivalent of sentences that were more relevant. So you're looking for, say, what what is, say, a, just a simple phrase that occurs, such as go to and what is a noun. Um, but... Uh, if, if I think about that, I wonder whether we, when we uh, sequence um, worm locomotion on a plate, whether we should look at where it started from and what was the neighboring local environment and what was the ultimate uh, destination, let's say, on a short interval, because in some sense, you, that, that, in that case, you'd have, say, the beginning of the sentence, say, the, the beginning, and then the verb would be, say, the, the locomotion uh, in that in time interval and the uh, destination would be the end points of that sentence. So you'd sort of have um, phrases which have some biological meaning rather than just looking at sequences and trying to sequence them based on uh, a reasonable uh, definition of complexity. Yeah, yeah, I think if I understand your question, I think it's um, a, a good point that you know, when you're just looking at this, this sort of comes back to how how we anchor what we're what we're doing, and so we we sort of resorted to doing comparisons between conditions. Um, but if we knew more about the environment, or or if we had a more enriched environment, then maybe we could say locally, kind of within a sequence. Well, now it's trying to leave this chamber. Now it's trying to do something else, and we could um, maybe, or at least look for potential uh, correlations between the environment and, and the behavior. We're dealing with relatively uniform environments. Experimentally, it's sort of the easiest end of the spectrum. We just put worms there and record them. But then, yeah, in terms of the analysis, uh, we're, we're kind of unanchored, as I would say, which is why we resort to these comparisons in terms of deciding what's important. But yeah, with, with better environments, with more interesting environments, I, I think that would be very interesting. Uh, well, interesting. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, another interesting thing to look at is um, the um, changes in uh, usage of sequences from your dictionary when worms are chemotaxing up versus down a gradient. Um, you should get some nice contrast there. Yeah, that's that's true, actually. That, that's a good point. Because you'd find, as you'd expect, or, well, I, I assume what you would find is that when they're going down gradient, turns become much more likely, reversals are more likely. Uh, just, you know, in, in other words, what we know about chemotaxis. But, yeah, we haven't checked that. That's, that's a good point. That would be interesting. And I was just going to say that if you apply, so right now when you're taking your worms and you're beginning your sequences, they all can be in different states, potentially. Or they probably are. Um, but if you give some sort of strong stimulus at the beginning of your recording period, for example, you can force them all into a very similar or more similar state, and then maybe you could see some more uh, repetitive patterns between the different animals, potentially. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I have I have an example. If I um, how are we doing for time, Stephen? Do I have time to show a couple yep, videos? Yeah, we got we got 15 minutes left uh, in total in the session for for a okay. okay. Yeah, let me just give you a quick example of a worm being forced into a state. Um, okay. Uh, where is it? All right. So here. Um, so here we have uh, a worm. This is um, expressing channel rhodopsin in all of its cholinergic motor neurons, which means that when we turn on the blue light, basically all the muscles contract at the same time, and the worm sort of does a funky little behavior. Uh, you can see that here. You'll see when the light comes on. Right there. So you see the worm contracts a little bit, and it does this sort of awkward dorsal bend, keeps sort of coiling around. It's now free to do what it wants. And uh, if we look at the uh, postures, 
Um, so this plot shows time along the uh, bottom, and each row is the probability of it being in one of the 90 postures. So each row is the probability of one posture. The yellow bar shows where the light comes on, and you can see, for example, at the top there are these sort of sets of postures that become uh, much more likely. Um, and these ones here become much less likely. Uh, if we look at what those things actually are, you can see the things that become more likely are these dorsal turns, as we expected, and the things that become less likely are basically just normal forward locomotion. So basically, normal for forward locomotion is extremely unlikely if you are contracting all your muscles at the same time. Um, maybe the more interesting one is uh, this other strain. This one is expressing channel rhodopsin in the ASH neuron. Uh, neurons, which is a neuron associated with um, aversive stimuli. So we're basically you know, triggering this escape response when we turn the light on. And here you see a sort of even more stereotyped behavior. And you can see these uh, sort of this, this line, basically, of uh, postures that become more common at the top. And uh, oops. Uh, and are, and those, are those heat maps for a single worm repeating the stimulus or averaging over multiple worms? These are averaging over multiple worms, uh, but you do see it. Um, you know, you, you see it in a in a single worm as well. But uh, yeah, th this this plot is averaged over, uh, averaged over several. And um, yeah, so what you see basically is uh, if we look what's overrepresented during the stimulus, and then five seconds after, we find sort of what you'd expect this this reversal behavior followed by uh, a ventral turn. Uh, so yeah, so I think it is it is quite interesting. It becomes much more stereotyped when we when we force them. And, and we can we can see those differences. Uh, Andre, uh, you're you're showing uh, postures there. Uh, one thing I'm having trouble understanding is um, where do you go with these uh, seagrams in terms of uh, worm comparisons? I mean, it seems like comparing those postures is maybe relatively straightforward, or n-grams, but. Uh, how, what do you have in mind in terms of comparisons? And I guess one thing that came to mind was getting back to uh, what, what Tiffany had said about uh, maybe like loose matching, so this one does it, uh, one seagram, and this one does another one. They're different, but they're similar. I, I'm curious as to what you have in mind in terms of strain comparison. Um, well, I think it's what, what we've done is is already sort of potentially useful. We'll probably continue doing that for some other strains, basically just you know counting frequencies and getting a kind of spectrum of difference between them. Um, one possibility that's tolerant, I mean, as, as Tiffany sort of brought up, that's tolerant of, of mismatches and things are, uh, you know, dynamic programming algorithms from bioinformatics for, uh, you know, sort of finding optimal alignments between things. We don't want to try and do a global alignment, of course, uh, as you would with a genome, because we don't really think, at least for these, at least for the spontaneous behavior, we don't think the, you know, first half of the video from one worm is related to the first half of another. But still, you know, there are sort of local versions of these sorts of alignment algorithms, which I think would be really interesting. Um, and would probably be, yeah, more more powerful for comparisons and, and just all around better. Uh, but we we haven't done it yet. But, uh, yeah. Any anything in particular that would start to get at uh, gene function, or I guess that's what I'm really struggling with is oh, okay. how do you um, re how do you relate a, a a knockout or a change in gene function to all these complex seagrams? Yeah, you could basically take the same approach that we took before. Uh, so you could take the frequency spectrum of your different behavioral sets as a feature vector and just do any sorts of clustering you normally would, um, just as you would with any other kind of feature vector. Uh, that probably wouldn't be optimal, especially if you use all of the different uh, C-grams. You'd probably want to select some subset. Um, one way of selecting a subset maybe would be the compression approach. Um, but of course, there are lots of ways of doing feature selection. Um, so that would be one possibility. Another possibility actually would be compression itself. Um, I think this is conceptually an interesting idea, but I think in practice actually doesn't work that well. But what you can do is create a dictionary on one strain, and then you can use that dictionary to compress the sequence of another strain. And if they're behaviorally very similar, then the dictionary that you learn on one strain should be effective at compressing another. If they're very different, then you'll find sort of poor compression performance. So you can sort of come up with a distance measure actually based on using different dictionaries to compress different sequences, which I love as an idea. But uh, you know, this kind of thing, people have done it in language and things, and you know, they've published papers on it. But really, it doesn't work as well as other. I mean, people have come up with other methods that work better. So although I like that method, it's uh, uh, maybe not the best, sadly. Just to give some insight as to why 
um, there are two factors that kind of fight each other with compression. Uh, one is if, if you have a mutant that runs its way through a restricted subset of a, of a wild type distribution, um, it will inherently be more, more compressed because it's just it's doing a lot of stuff which is being poorly represented and it's all getting dumped into one si signal and so it's kind of falsely compressing things. On the other hand, um, when you have something that doesn't fit your, your cloud of, of k-means points very well, instead of kind of nicely traversing your way through the centers, you can kind of go in this, you know, less well-defined path and to kind of hit more of them as you go through, and that would make it less uh, compressible. So I, I think it's, this is a, it's a tricky thing to get right to be able to show, you know, that you're not just saying something, you know, deriving a fancy way of telling yourself that the space you're sampling from is, is different at the kind of token level. Yeah, so one, one thing about the, um, how well the wild type postures fit the, the mutants. Uh, so we, we, we have checked that. Uh, and um, they, they actually work reasonably well. So the, uh, you still get a reasonably good quality fit to the uncoordinated data using the wild type uh, basis. And at least for the comparisons we did uh, that, I, that I showed you today, like those compressibility, compressibility differences and things, uh, we don't see, we, we certainly see quantitative differences. We don't see qualitative differences in the results if we use, uh, you know, in other words, if you use an uncoordinated dictionary on the uncoordinated worms and ask how compressible they are, you don't get a very different answer than if you use the wild type dictionary and ask how compressible they are. So th that part of the um, problem, I think, is, is not so, so much of a problem, at least for, for worms. Um, and the issue of, of a sort of just exploring a restricted sort of subspace of the, of the larger space, definitely you'll see uh, yeah, differences in compressibility there uh, just because of that. Yeah, I agree. That's for sure. Well, I think, I think the tricky part is it could be very strain dependent um, because each strain is going to have its own quirks of behavior. And for, um, for some strains, uh, the wild type sequences may work very well. For, for others, if you have something, with, for example, with really deep body bends, the wild type sequences probably are not going to represent the really deep body bends um, through motion very well because wild type worms just don't do that. So. Um, yeah. Whether that means it hits a lot of tokens poorly or it hits very few tokens that happen to be very deep, I think is would be difficult to predict in advance. So it's just it's something to keep, you know, it's kind of it's, it, you never end up with it as a settled question. You kind of have to come back and readdress it every time. Yeah, absolutely, that's for sure. I, that I totally agree with. That, that you know, for every new problem, you definitely want to check that again because it's a it's a, it's a constant risk for sure. I, I have a question. Um, did you try to use the uh, uh, with N2 um, worms uh, for uh, finding template postures because uh, somehow they uh, they can generate the most general uh, set of uh, postures uh, in C. elegans or was it because they're most accessible? Uh, because I think that what if I understand what uh, Rex is saying. Uh, basically, we want to have for the template postures the most uh, general uh, general forms uh, that uh, are possible, and maybe we should maybe we should cluster from all the um, all the worms that are known that are dis different from each other. Um, I don't know what what do you I mean. That's just an idea that occurred to me. Yeah, yeah, we, we uh, it's a good idea. We we tried that as well. The reason we stuck with the wild type postures is that it didn't make um, a huge difference. So we did also train on kind of the joint set. So we just sampled from all of the different 300 strains, some of which are very uncoordinated, and sort of made a new set of postures. Um, and it didn't uh, make a big difference to, to the results in the end. So we thought it was, again, just a, a little bit simpler conceptually to just stick to the, uh, uh, the wild type uh, postures. We saw the same thing when we were looking at the um, eigenworms, you know, using the sort of Will Rue, Greg Stevens approach of representing behavior with eigenworms. If you build your eigenworms from wild type data or from, uh, you know, sort of all your data together, or even actually many of the uncoordinated strains, you find actually quite similar shapes coming out. 
Um, so we, again, we thought sort of for simplicity we would stick to the wild time. Hey, so we have a question from the internet um, here before we wrap up. So we got an online comment from Cybernaut a posting on the Google Plus page. And Cybernaut asks, are there discernible differences in the overall average worm posture for each strain in each mode? Uh, are there oh, uh, so differences? So if we look just at the level of postures to compare the strains, I guess that means um, it, it's, it's so essentially that would be comparing the uh, just you know posture probabilities, I suppose, as opposed to trigram probabilities. Um, I think so, yeah. Question uh, correctly, so that is uh, that is the case. You can detect differences that way, definitely. Um, so in in some Cases, yeah, worms will be more likely to take on curved postures. For example, certainly during an escape response, uh, you can find individual postures that are more or less likely. Uh, actually, you could see that in those sort of heat maps I was showing. So some cases, just that that average difference in the in the postures is is very informative. Um, but we didn't do only that. You sort of also consider the sequences because there's extra information there. I, I hope I understood the the question. I think so. I, I posted it there uh, in the chat if you want to read it again, but I think that I think that does capture it. Yeah. I think that's yeah. I hope so. Cool. All right. Any other questions here from our panel? Uh, Andre, I was wondering uh, how you might apply these techniques to your new multiple worm tracker, and if there's uh, different approaches or. Or if you've considered, or, or if, if in the multiple worm case you're simply going to consider each worm serially and then apply the same techniques to the recordings of, of individual worms isolated, or if you're going to think of masses of worms and, and look at the grammar of, of, uh, of masses of worms. Um, when they're actually in the clumps, so if, if we have, let's say, we have a strain that aggregates strongly so that they form these sort of large groups, we're not able to track them in the clump, um, so we wouldn't be able to extract the same thing. What I think would be interesting, though, would be to take space into account already. And uh, that would be um, to think, you know, an isolated worm that we can track, where we can extract the grammar, when it's close to a clump or far away from a clump, you know, do we see different, you know, sequences being represented? You know, is there is there a bit of, um, uh, yeah, interaction between them? And I, I have no idea if that would be the case. It's something actually we, we talked. Uh, uh, I've talked re briefly with uh, Ian Cousin about this. He studies collective behavior, um, and so we were thinking of applying the same thing to fish, which would be very interesting. I think looking at so he's very interested in you know kind of social networks and animals and things and how information propagates through a population of, of fish. In that case, you know you have a predator and then somehow the information gets through. So they they think about these things all the time. But it would be interesting also to see in terms of their uh, specific postural sequences how that information propagates through the. Uh, through the fish, and you know, and for fish, you know, you can get a midline is not too bad for many fish for representing them. So I think it would be doable and really interesting to, yeah, multi-animal case as well could be very cool. Can I ask one question about collaboration? Since uh, we sure. love collaboration, so just between you and uh, and Alex, there, um, how did you guys uh, come to work on this together? Um, what were the relative, uh, you know, contributions that uh, that you guys made, and and what were the strengths that you brought to the table in that collaboration? Mm, um, question. So we, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, first at the American Physical Society meeting? It certainly would have been some conference where we met. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. And there are not so many people that are interested in sort of physics and behavior, quantifying behavior, so it's almost nice when you meet one to, to start talking. Um, and yeah, when you find I find when I find someone that shares a similar perspective, you sort of latch on. You want to talk to them more, and so then we sort of yeah started talking about things we could do. Alex has a background in um, uh, you know non-equilibrium thermodynamics, uh, so we think a lot about you know sequences and probabilities of sequences, and so we're sort of continuing to think along those lines. And yeah, so it's, it's a nice, just nice connection to find like like-minded people who started talking and then you start working. Yeah, I'd say the same. It's not so. Uh, not so common, but it's becoming more common now to find people that's interested in quantitative analysis of behavior. And so Greg Stevens introduced me to Andre. And then the second thing is that it's really, really wonderful to work with Andre. I mean, I don't need to, I don't need to praise him in public, but in, we all, we've, we've all had collaborate, collaborators, and 
it can be really hard to work with people, but that can just be like personal ways of functioning. And working with Andrew is wonderful. So these two things together, I think, um, are a good combination. And yeah, and, and I think we have many more ideas um, here. And we treat, we try to meet in what we call lab attacks. So we meet for two or three or four days and work hard on, on something to get stuff done. So I think this is going to repeat in the future. And we have ideas of applying on relating compressibility to entropy production and other cool ideas, most of which we, we will fail, but it's, it's super fun. Cool. Maybe next we can see what the compressibility of your lab attack interactions looks like if you put those into sequences. <laughs> we can see what the patterns are with your collaboration, too. <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, um, we are uh, we have we have reached the end of our time slot. Um, I want to thank uh, Andre for uh, doing this presentation. I want to thank all the panelists for devoting your time and for your excellent questions um, and and joining us here. Um, so uh, if uh, you've made it this far for the watching, um, thank you very much as well to the to the audience for uh, coming to check this out. Um, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you'd like to see more of this content. Uh, we will be doing other journal clubs uh, coming down the road in the future. And um, so for now, uh, we'll uh, bid you all adieu and uh, say thank you very much. Right. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.